As movies age, it's basically a given that effects, and even whole films, that were once viewed as innovative will eventually be seen as primitive or even laughable compared to the achievements that were made over time. And while there are arguably hundreds of movies that have been affected by this, one of the most famous examples would have to be the original 1933 version of King Kong. What was once viewed as an amazing example of special effects on film has today become the subject of mockery by many people who laugh at how jerky and primitive the effects for the titular ape were, especially when compared to the con from the 2005 version or the Monsterverse movies. And while it is understandable that the original King Kong doesn't carry the amazement and gravitas that it once did, some people are honestly way too hard on this movie, because many don't understand just how amazing and innovative it really was back in 1933, and the many ways it does still hold up. And today, I'd like to go over all of the different ways the original King Kong movie revolutionized films, and why the stop motion used deserves more respect than it's often given. And just in case you somehow don't know the story of King Kong and how it plays out, there will be spoilers for it ahead. Okay, so to put it simply, no. The stop motion in King Kong is not the pinnacle of what the medium can offer. But at the same time, that isn't to say it deserves to be mocked either. Because what people have to remember is that this movie was made in 1933. Sound movies alone weren't even five years old, and special effects like stop motion were still in their infancy. Before King Kong, the best special effects one could find was in the 1925 silent movie The Lost World, which are even more dated because the dinosaur models were made out of wood. But with King Kong, stop motion animator Willis O'Brien and his assistant made the Kong puppet with extreme complexity, having a metal skeleton with muscles that actually expanded and contracted like real ones when the body was moved. And O'Brien himself was actually disappointed that Kong's fur moved every time he touched it but many at the time saw it as Khan's fur blowing in the wind, which only added a further level of realism to him. But movements in the fur and the occasional jerkiness aside, do you know how difficult it was for O'Brien to bring that giant ape to life, especially in 1933? I mean, one can't deny that it looks primitive compared to stop motion now, but keep in mind that he didn't have access to the things animators take for granted today. In fact, O'Brien actually invented quite a few of those techniques for this movie. I mean, just take a look at the fight between King Kong and the T-Rex, for example. Now, keep in mind that for both these models, O'Brien had to move them the slightest bit, have a picture taken of them, and then move them the tiniest bit again, and take another picture. To put it simply, a scene like this not only requires infinite patience, but a lot of time, and O'Brien in his geniusness still manages to incorporate stuff like actual fighting techniques into Khan's movements so that it actually makes sense why he wins the fight. He could have easily done the bare minimum as far as that fight goes, and most would have still been impressed. But he went above and beyond to make it an actual fight between two animals. That scene suddenly doesn't look so laughable now, does it? And like I said before, 
What makes O'Brien's achievements even more impressive here is how little he had to work with. He didn't even have the benefit of a green screen to help him out, as that wouldn't be invented for another seven years. And honestly, that's why for many experts and stop-motion enthusiasts, King Khan is their holy grail. Because not only did Willis O'Brien basically pull off the impossible with the resources available to him, but many are still baffled by how he pulled off some of the things he did. That's right, even with today's advancements in stop motion, Willis O'Brien did things with King Khan back in 1933 that leave modern animators stumped as to how he did it. And like I touched on before, that's to say nothing of his dedication to make King Khan feel like a real animal. And for just one example of that, take a look at when Khan climbs onto the train platform. His foot actually moves slightly from side to side, just like a real animal's would. But do you know how much extra work that was for O'Brien to add that detail most people wouldn't even pick up on? Six hours at the minimum. He went to all that extra work just so Khan would move more realistically, even if virtually nobody would notice it. Seriously, this man should have an award named after him, not have his work ridiculed because it's now seen as primitive in ways he couldn't avoid. Because even if you want to disregard everything else I just said, there's another reason the effects in King Khan have managed to stand the test of time, if relatively speaking. Which is that King Khan is actually his own character. The audience can read his face, his body language, and actually know what he's thinking. When he first appears, he evokes a sense of unimaginable terror with just a hint that there might be something more to him. And then as time goes on, we do see that he has a softer, more tender side. And then by the end, when he's dying on the Empire State Building, you actually come to sympathize with him. I mean, just look at the defeated look on his face as he clings to life looking at the woman that fascinated him. And his movements and facial expressions, along with the music, all help to sell the tragedy of his death as he then finally loses his balance and proceeds to fall to the ground below, cementing the big ape status in cinematic history as a tragic monster. Now, what's my point here, you might be asking? that Willis O'Brien is actually able to get the viewer to empathize with King Khan and be able to understand him. That's how detailed his stop motion was. He gives a stop motion puppet body language, which, once again, is insanely difficult when you can only move him one frame at a time. To put it another way, King Khan isn't just a puppet being moved around. O'Brien turned him into an actual character, and a lesser animator would have never been able to put that much level of depth and personality into King Khan. And as I just got through saying, the fact that it is so easy to understand and sympathize with him is a major reason the movie is still well known today. Because he's more than just a giant killing machine, and O'Brien makes sure the audience knows that long before he makes his iconic exit. Again, compared to today, his stop motion might not seem all that impressive, but in actuality, the magnitude of what he was able to achieve simply cannot be overstated. But Willis O'Brien's stop motion isn't the only place where this movie was revolutionary, because it was also one of the first movies to actually have an almost continuous musical score playing throughout the entire film. 
And while taken for granted today, in the early days of sound movies, most film directors didn't really know how to handle the new innovation. And as a result, a lot of sound movies were filmed just like silent movies with dialogue and often suffered in terms of pacing as a result. Especially because it was believed the audience wouldn't accept music being played in the background if it wasn't explicitly shown where the music was coming from. Sounds silly, I know, but once again, there was a time where such things did have to be questioned. But the point is, while King Kong just seems like a regular old film today, the fact that it actually had overdubbed music, and music written for the film, no less, playing throughout the entire movie, and not to mention a particularly good score for a film of its nature, really changed how films were made, as not long after continuous film scores became a common fixture of movies. But it gets even more complex in that department as well. Because in certain scenes, up to three different noises had to be layered onto the film, which would be the sounds recorded during actual filming, such as the actor's dialogue, sounds that had to be dubbed in later, such as the noises King Khan makes, and the musical score. And again, today that might not sound like a big deal, especially because you could easily do that with a cheap cell phone, but keep in mind that back in 1933, sometimes they had problems getting one layer of sound onto the film. Forget about three. And the fact that they were able to accomplish that pretty seamlessly not only proved that sound layering could be done, especially with a musical score, but quickly inspired many other films to start experimenting with how sound could be used beyond dialogue and mundane sound effects. In other words, King Khan was extremely revolutionary in how sound and music was used in films, more than it's usually given credit for. In fact, it's often taken for granted in this department because it invented most of the techniques that are so commonplace in movies today that nobody even pays them any mind, not understanding how novel it all was in 1933. And finally, the writing must also be given some credit, because this movie basically invented the concept of the giant monster attacking a city. And while it's certainly not the best screenplay ever written, one thing that's done extremely well is the character of King Khan himself, which as I noted before, Willis O'Brien brought to life better than most would have thought possible. Although, for another thing, the movie spends almost 45 minutes making the audience wonder what might be in that jungle, and somehow the answer manages to be everything it was built up as, and more. And there's also the fact that in most remakes of King Khan, there's a scene where Anne, or her character equivalent, comes to understand Khan and see that he's not just a monster. But in this version, such a scene never happens, and it's arguably better off for it. Instead, Anne remains terrified of him the entire time. Only when he's secured on the wheel does she show anything resembling pity for him, and the moment he escapes, she goes right back to viewing him as the monster from her nightmares sent to torment her. And honestly... All of that serves to make Khan's death even more tragic. Because we never find out why Khan is so obsessed with Anne. We just know that he is. But instead of a traditional story where Beauty is able to redeem the Beast, Anne is instead terrified of him and wants nothing to do with him. And when Khan realizes this, he basically accepts defeat and lets the planes finish him off. And this is where arguably the movie's most famous line comes from. Oh no, it wasn't the airplanes. 
it was beauty killed the beast. Because again, Anne's unwavering fear of King Khan eventually causes him to just give up, accepting that she'll always be horrified of him. And as I already noted, the fact that in other versions a connection forms between the two somewhat undermines this, because the tragedy of his death is laid most bare when she wants nothing to do with him and truly does see him as a monster. So in the end, he accepts defeat and lets himself be gunned down so he will never torment her again. To put it simply, the tragedy of King Khan is one big deconstruction of Beauty and the Beast and shows exactly what happens when Beauty doesn't accept the Beast and sees him as a monster. Though in this case, Anne's stance is completely understandable, because in the end, King Khan really is a giant, dangerous animal. So of course your average person is going to be nothing but absolutely terrified of him. Okay, so to sum it all up, King Khan deserves more respect. Not just for the insane dedication and work of Willis O'Brien on the titular ape himself, but for its other contributions to film as well, particularly when it comes to how it revolutionized sound. Because what more people these days need to realize is, effects don't make the movie. Just because something doesn't have the most modern, up-to-date effects possible, that doesn't mean it's bad. The furthest thing from it, actually. As I spent half the video going over, most will never know what Willis O'Brien went through to bring King Khan to life and make him as lifelike as possible. And moreover, many will write off all of his extremely impressive achievements just because they look primitive. And as I've already noted, that simply isn't fair. There's a reason this movie is still considered a classic by film experts, and it's about time that it started being appreciated by more casual viewers as such, instead of being the subject of extremely undeserved mockery. Okay, I think I've made my point with all of this. So now why don't all of you tell me? Do you believe that the original King Khan is a masterpiece that deserves more recognition as a revolutionary piece of cinema? Or do you believe it's too dated to be truly appreciated in this day and age? Please let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And please keep in mind, you don't have to agree with any opinions expressed in this video. You can feel however you want to about the 1933 version of King Khan and its effects, and if you think I've got it all wrong, that's perfectly okay. And thank you all for watching. I greatly appreciate all of it, and I hope to see you all next time.